So Erev Tov, everyone. The topic tonight is interfaith dialogue in Jewish law. Now, this can be a very, very big and very tricky topic. One of the things that is, are, are, is not our main topic tonight is what should an interfaith dialogue look like or should look like? The question that we're really going to tackle tonight is should it happen in the first place? But before we get into some of those opinions on whether or not there's a value of different religious groups having a formal talk uh, about their religion, I want to step back and look at some of the ways that Judaism views other religions. So imagine you have a spectrum of the way that Judaism views other religions. So first, on one extreme, you kind of have the Torah version of it. Now, the Torah does not forbid other religions. It recognizes other nations. Some we should have relationships, some we shouldn't. But fundamentally, what the Torah forbids is for Israelites or Jews to be idolaters. They may not have any other gods before God. Idolatry is verboten, totally forbidden, A. And idolatry, even for non-Jews, is forbidden in the land of Israel. Now, that idea has been expanded and evolved through the oral tradition towards the idea that idolatry really should is bad um, everywhere. Um, but ultimately, Jews should stay away from idolatry. So on one end of the spectrum, the idea is that anything to do with real idolatry, Jews need to have nothing to do with it. You know, on one extreme, I, either wiping it out or just nothing to do with it, not interacting with the people who commit idolatry, actively rejecting them. Now, the question is, what today is that true idolatry? If you find a Canaanite who is offering their children as a sacrifice to the, to the false god Molech, you know, you should not go have a beer with them at the pub. That doesn't really exist as much today. So if we move more to the middle of the spectrum, you have religions, perhaps like Hinduism and other religions, where they really do seem to bow down. They believe in other gods. They have statues, etc. But they're also religions of peace. And the fact that we also have do not have Jews, don't have a long history with Hindus and a persecution is also part of it. So we see them as idolaters, but we don't see them as evil per se. So while we may not have uh, religious interactions with them, we could have business interactions, whatever. And then you move even more along the spectrum and you get into religions like Christianity and Islam. Now we had a class earlier this year about how Jews view Christianity. Some rabbis absolutely consider that Christians because of their worship of God in the form of Jesus is idolatry, but many, many consider it not to be idolatry, rather it's a form of worship of the one true God, but it's a form that's forbidden for Jews. So they're not idolaters, but you're not allowed to be Christians. So you can do business with them, you can be friends with them, but you can't be Christian, you can't marry a Christian, et cetera, like that. And there are certain issues with going into their prayer space, not because it's an idolatrous forbidden space, but because someone sees you go into church, they think that you're becoming a Christian and that's problematic. And then you have on the, the far right of the spectrum, something like Islam. So you can't be a Muslim, but there's nothing forbidden about them. And I guess on the even further end of the spectrum are things that are secular like Thanksgiving, they're like the, the holiday of Thanksgiving. There is nothing um, forbidden up Thanksgiving. There's nothing about gods or anything like that. So we go from real idolatry, absolutely forbidden, actively wiping it out to religions that we can be friends with. But the question is with something like Christianity, where we're not allowed to be Christian, are there any limits on the interactions between them? And part of that answer is really mixed up in the history of our relationship with Christianity, particularly forced conversions, persecution. And for those who were here a few weeks ago in our class on Nachmanides Ramban, any public debates, interfaith dialogue, were usually debates where the Christians were trying to actively prove us wrong, and by doing so, convince Jews to convert. So the history of relations with Christians and Jews outside of business was always very, very negative. And there was this constant fear of, they don't like us, they think our religion is wrong, and we need to convert. That is where our story uh, essentially begins from. So if you ask 200 years ago, of course we can't have interfaith dialogues with us. All they're trying to do is convert us. We can do business with them, that's it. But then in the 1960s, something changes. The, the Catholic Church holds something called the Second Ecumenic, Ecumenical Vatican Council, or Vatican II, and they do it over a series of the uh, years, 1962 to 1965. They start with the 23rd Pope and it lasts so long, they end with the sixth Pope. That's just something about the naming of Popes. But through that time, they, they have a number of official edicts 
they put out these popular these um these documents about new policies that they have that are voted on. And in 1964, um, Pope Paul VI, as you can see, um, officially signed his name on an edict called, I'm not sure how to pronounce the Latin, like uh, Nostra Etete, uh, something like that. Um, but it had to do with the way the Catholic Church dealt with Jews, because for hundreds of years, thousands of years, Jews were seen as potentially those who had killed their God, or as those whose religion was wrong and needed to be converted. And they decided to change that. And in a vote of something like 2,200 bish bishops to 88, they decided to pass this document. And this document was supposed to change everything about the relationship between Catholics or Christians in general and Jews and other faiths. And we're going to read part of that document in a moment, and then we're going to see how the Jews responded to it. But remember everything I said. Jews have generally been opposed to interacting with other religions, particularly Christians, because Christians are always trying to, or were, always trying to convert us or persecute us. So Susan, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, and I'll have you read this first document. Okay. And again, try and think about, you know, what are they actually asking for here? What are they saying here? I, I cut out some of the document. A lot of it was just quoting the Gospels. Um, but it seems like a very beautiful, positive document on its surface. And there's no reason to expect that there are ulterior motives. Um, so go ahead, source number one, Susan, please. Uh, just one question. Is this yeah. translated from the Latin or Italian? So this, where did I, I, I think I just Googled this and found it on an official website. It did not say if it was a translation. Uh -huh. Um, it is very, very likely that it was probably in uh, the Latin. Um, I didn't do a side by side. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I'm sure it was. But I, I imagine this English translation is fairly accurate um, to what yeah. they message. Okay, well, it's, I think it means in our time. Okay, in our time, when day by day, humankind is being drawn closer together and the ties between different peoples are becoming stronger, the church examines more closely her relationship to non-Christian religions. In her task of promoting unity and love among people, and indeed among nations, she considers above all this de declaration that pe what people have in common and what draws them to fellowship. Before people, you go on, I, uh, oh, sorry, really quick. This One of the sections I took out here is actually quite a beautiful section where the document talks about multiple religions, how each of them brought something valuable to the world. And it even it mentions Hinduism, Buddhism. So it's religions that have been seen classically as idolatrous, but saying that each of them, basically all religions are trying to deal with the same questions and they're all trying to approach it from a different way. And there is value in that. And we respect that everybody's on a journey to discover the truths of the universe. And one of the things is the church and Jews often focus on the truth of one God, but here they're validating religions that have more than one God. So that's the paragraph I skipped. So please continue. People expect or men expect. People expect from the various religions answers to the unsolved riddles of the human condition, which today, even as in former times, deeply stirs the hearts of people. What is man? Um, what is the meaning, the aim of our life? What is moral good? What is sin? When suffering and what purpose does it serve? Which is the road to true happiness? What are death, judgment and retribution after death? What finally is that ultimate ir ir inexpressible mystery which en encompasses our existence? Whence do we come and where are we going? Oh, it should be whither are we going? Religions, however, that are bound up with an advanced culture have struggled to answer the same questions by means of more refined concepts and a more developed language. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in those, these religions. She regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings, which though differing in many aspects from the ones she holds and sets forth, nonetheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all people. The church therefore exhorts her sons and daughters that through dialogue and collaboration with the followers of other religions carried out with the pr prudence and love. Et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. So you can see here some of their background thinking, which is that everybody's trying to answer the big questions and every religion has some value. Now, the Catholics who are writing this might feel that they have the closest thing to truth, but they're saying there's something valuable to learn to every religion. Now that statement has a lot of truth and validity to it. And they suggest that the way to enhance this is with dialogue. For thousands of years, the ways religion interact is either leave me alone or I'm trying to actively convert you. 
But here they're saying, no, why don't we actually work together? The world has seen enough suffering. Think about the World War II, World War I, the Holocaust. The world has fought enough. It's time to start coming together. Those are beautiful ideals. And some of the background of the statement is there was actually a Jew, I forgot his full name, but Isaacs is his last name in Europe, who had kind of been pushing for this. And he was actually part of a group in Europe of Jews and Christians, kind of an alliance who had already started this interfaith uh, type of dialogue. So once this document came out, the hope was that the relationships, it was specifically written between Catholics and Jews, but it included Muslims as well and other religions. But the idea is that this would spur all of these interfaith kinds of dialogues to better um, relations. And in fact, in Boston, there was just such an attempt. There was a college there that started, and I'm not sure if it's still around, it might be, but they started a formal program for interfaith dialogue. Beautiful thing, except a lot of rabbis saw this with great suspicion, and the Orthodox world sat around and said, this is troubling, because again, classically, when Christians have interacted with Jews, other than business, it's been to try and convert us. And if we're going to sit in a room and talk about the text and about God, what else would they have other than an ulterior motive to convert us? Why would a Jehovah's Witness come to my door just to shoot the breeze? They're clearly, if they talk about God, they're trying to get me to believe in their God. Now, historically, there's a lot of truth to that. Christians are typically have not brought the idea of God to Jews just out of friendship. They brought it because they were trying to convert them. So that historical background influenced some of the initial responses to it. So we're going to look at is in 1964, when this came out, I'm just looking at who is the she. I'm not sure what that means, Jeffrey, but if that question isn't answered, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, that in 1964, in response to this program in Boston, um, Rav, uh, Rav Soloveitchik, who uh, became the head of Yeshiva University or head rabbi there, but was from Boston, or at least grew up in Boston, and that was kind of his uh, base of operations, was struggling how to respond to this. Is this something that is appropriate for Jews? And one of the issues here is, if Christianity is just straight up idolatry, it's easy to say it's forbidden. It's totally forbidden to engage with idolaters. But at this point, they couldn't really say that Christianity was idolatry because it's not explicitly idolatry. Jews can't be Christians. They can't participate in Christian worship or religious rituals, but they're not idolaters. So can we forbid this? So if there's not a legal or mitzvah commandment-based issue here, then maybe it's a matter of policy. Is it appropriate to do so? So what we're going to see are the different responses. So the first place we'll start is actually Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal, who obviously represented the more uh, ultra-Orthodox Haredi world, and he actually wrote several letters to Rav Soloveitchik. They were in discussion with each other about whether or not interfaith dialogue should be permitted or encouraged, at least formally, and should they push against the ones that were in place. And Rav Moshe takes a very strict stance, but one of the things that you'll see is what is his basis for it? So Gloria and Leonard, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. And then Gloria, if you would please read, this is um, part of Rav Moshe's response or a letter he wrote to Rav Soloveitchik about whether or not this ecumenical um, uh, uh, kind of interfaith dialogue should be allowed. And you'll see real quick what he thinks the point of these interfaith dialogues are. So Gloria, please. With regards to ecumenism, which has emerged from the council of the leaders of the Christian faith, whose purpose is to convert Jews. Uh, Chas v'shalom, God forbid that they should convert Jews. That's how he's, he's using it. Which act of Satan has succeeded in tempting a number of rabbis to join with preachers in established committees in a number of places and also conventions in the USA and Europe. So pause there for a moment. So as far as when he sees that document from Vatican II, it's clear to him that there's no good motivations. It's 100% a trick to convert the Jews. And he also gives us a little bit of uh, background information, which is a lot of these interfaith groups already existed. So he's saying it was somehow Satan um, uh, tricked these rabbis into thinking it was okay to do this. So this was Rav Moshe's perspective behind it. Um, now, again, um, the, of the 2,000 plus bishops that voted on this, did any of them hope that somehow these interfaith dialogues would convert Jews? Maybe, probably. Was this the point of the document? Not 
according to what the document said. Practically speaking, how many Jews have been converted or enticed because of interfaith dialogue? Probably very few. Wow. Are there Jews that do indeed convert and are, are proselytized towards Christianity each year in significant numbers? Certainly there are. Um, but is the Vatican II the cause of that? It doesn't seem to be. But for Rav Moshe, again, looking back at the history of all of these attempts of the church to reach out to the Jews, they really have, for the most part through history, been about converting the Jews. Is that the case here? Rav Moshe, it's not that he doesn't care, but he's beyond suspicious. So based on that, uh, he continues with the, the formal um, prohibition. Please, Gloria, we are therefore. We are therefore announcing this absolute prohibition for rabbis and preachers to join together in these groups or at conventions, not in Boston, America, or any other places. This applies not only when they will discuss religious matters, but even secular matters with no exceptions. One cannot support these ecumenical activities in any way because of the concern of mitzvahs. So may see, and I'll come back to that, it's referring to a mitzvah in the Torah of enticing someone to commit idolatry. So a Jew could do that. You know, a Jew could convince someone to do idolatry, but anyone who convinces someone towards, and again, it's specifically towards idolatry, it's one of the worst sins in the entire Torah. I mean, the pillars, you know, one of the pillars of the Torah is against idolatry. So leading someone, tricking them into idolatry, that is bad mojo. So, so he says, yeah, because of the concern of Macy. Leading someone into idolatry, even if that's not the intention, and we therefore establish this prohibition for all Orthodox rabbis. Excellent, thank you. So there are two extremely important things here, which we will see rabbis take a different perspective on. One, he, Rab Moshe, forbids interfaith dialogue on a halachic, on a, a legal Jewish law basis. He said it is connected to this mitzvah, this great sin of enticing others towards idolatry. But that also assumes that Christianity is indeed idolatry. And even if he says it's not quite idolatry, it, it's a bit of a stretch to bring up that mitzvah. But again, many follow him. Many consider that to be, um, you know, it's, it's absolutely forbidden according to Jewish law. So that's one thing. He says interfaith dialogue is forbidden by a matter of Jewish law. But the second thing he says is, even if preachers and rabbis want to go to Collectivo and talk about the Super Bowl, that's all also forbidden. Because once they start talking about the Rams, they're going to start talking about, you know, the second coming of the Messiah, et cetera, like that. Those are the two very important things that Rav Moshe rules on. A, it's a forbidden according to Jewish law, mitzvah connected to, and B, you can't talk about anything. You should have nothing to do with uh, leaders of other religions. Now, again, he doesn't forbid Jews and non-Jews from doing business, and he doesn't forbid a Jew from going to his neighbor um, and talking about the Super Bowl. He is talking about setting up these formal conventions where, where leaders of different religions, and even though he specifically focuses on Christianity, because he's responding to Vatican II, it's clear from everyone who reads this that he would apply this to any other religion uh, which is forbidden to Jews. I don't know what he would say about Muslims and Imams, because again, uh, Islam is really not seen as any form of idolatry. There are other issues in the tension between Jews and Muslims that is much more recent historically, but certainly Hinduism, uh, you know, Mormonism, et cetera, like that uh, would be a no-go for Rav Moshe. But what we're gonna see now is Rav Soloveitchik who read this, who was in dialogue with Rav Moshe, it takes a slightly different direction into very important points. But before I go on, are there any questions up until now? And again, just throw up your hand. Yes, Elizabeth, go ahead and unmute on your side. Yeah, my, when reading this, my feeling is he didn't have much faith in his, you know, co-religious people, did he? You know, if he thought just by conversing with them about something that's important, that they would all of a sudden drift off and become Christians. So it, it's so interesting you say that because again, as when I prepare classes like this, there are many documents and papers and, and sources I don't bring. And a lot of them, actually one of the classes we gave a few weeks ago about studying non-Jewish sources, even of other religions, go back to Maimonides. And one of the reasons mm -hmm. Maimonides was generally skeptical of the average, even though he studied everything, he didn't want the average person studying it because he was concerned that they would get misled. And that idea has continued and trickled down to this conversation, which is that 
there are certain rabbis who could have, like Nachmanides, when he had a public debate um, with, with the, the Christian you know, monks about Judaism versus Christianity, he can do it. He's not going to get confused. And in fact, he supposedly won the debate. But the average Joe on the street, this will entice them. And by the way, Rav Moshe is not talking even to an average uh, Jew and Christian. He's talking specifically to the rabbis. Um, he says in the Hebrew, lechol harabanim shomrei dat toratenu, to all of the rabbis who, who, who guard and protect our religion. So he's And he's not even just talking to all rabbis, specifically Orthodox rabbis. You would think he would have faith in them. But again, Rav Moshe, besides the fact that he's talking from a very ultra-Orthodox perspective, he is looking at the history of this. And this is a new idea. Were Rav Moshe or someone like Rav Moshe alive today and could look at how interfaith dialogues had gone and said, now based on how they've gone, do you still think it's forbidden? It'd be really interesting to see if he would change his, um, his perspective. Um, but that's a, that's a great point, Elizabeth. Excellent. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions? Beautiful. So Leonard, I'm going to have you take the next piece. So the next piece is Rav Soloveitchik. Now again, Rav Moshe and Rav Soloveitchik were in dialogue. So Rav Soloveitchik was very much aware of those two points. One, any discussion, even on secular matters, cannot be formalized. Again, formalized. I could call up, you know, there's a local, local preacher who I had coffee with once and we just shot the breeze. I can call him up and say, do you have a suggestion for a plumber? That's fine. But to have a formal council of religious suggestions for plumbers in, you know, in Milwaukee in the east side, that's not okay. Um, and the other thing is the idea that it's forbidden as a matter of law as opposed to policy, which means technically it's not forbidden, but our, we're deciding that we're just not going to do it as a, a political uh, you know, policy matter, as it were. Now, Rob Soloveitchik, that's all, was brilliant beyond compare. It's also notoriously difficult to understand. So I read much of his work. He wrote a beautiful work called On Confrontation, this long form article where he kind of talks about the, the re relationship between the religions, particularly Judaism and Christianity and a bit Islam. And then he kind of makes his, his point. And I also read a number of pieces that kind of explicated and explained what he said. But in short, everything leading up to, and by the way, this is actually a selection from a letter he wrote to the Rabbinical Council of America, which is basically a union for rabbis coming out of Yeshiva University. Now, their main thing is to make sure that the rabbis coming out of YU, long before my yeshiva ever existed, this is decades before, got jobs, were protected, got paid, et cetera, like that. But they also became kind of the official mouthpiece for Orthodox rabbis, or at least the, not the ultra-Orthodox, but mainstream modern Orthodox rabbis in America. So he wrote a letter to them about what their policy should be for their rabbis in their union about interfaith dialogue. And his point was basically that it's not fundamentally forbidden. There's nothing, there's no mitzvah being broken by doing this, but it's inappropriate. And the reason it's inappropriate is not even because of the fear of conversion. He doesn't even bring that up. The issue here is that each religion is unique and separate and there's even truth in each religion, but there's something, and this is where it gets really tricky in his language, there's something that only a Jew could understand. And to try and explain that to a Christian would dilute and confuse the matter. But at the same time, there's something that is unique to Christians that only Christians could understand. And trying to bridge those gaps will never work. A Jew can never fully uh, express what it means to be to, Jew, to be a Christian. So any theological, talking about God, philosophy, or anything like that would be at best confusing and at worst misleading um, about what the, other, uh, what the other is meaning to say. So it would just be, it wouldn't be valuable um, and it would take away from our uniqueness. I was talking to someone today about this and they're just saying, you know, I like being the minority. I don't wanna get, I don't wanna be part of a universal religion. I like being the little guy. So again, in this long, not, I don't want to say convoluted, but in this complicated way, he says, basically, there's no value in, in interfaith dialogue because there's nothing beneficial that could ever come out of it. Is he right? That's another question altogether. But that's what he felt, is there's nothing beneficial. And I don't know if he felt that it would be damaging per se, but sitting around and talking about afterlife, he's, there's nothing that could be you know, cross uh, valuable between the groups. Again, is he right about that? 
again, that's another question. So Leonard, um, this is his, where he kind of gets into practically um, what is and is not permitted. Go ahead, please, we are. We are therefore opposed to any public debate, dialogue or symposium concerning the doc, uh, doctrinal, dogmatic or ritual aspects of our faith. These are the similar aspects of another faith community. We believe in and are committed to our maker in a specific manner and we will not question, defend, offer, apologize, analyze, rather offer apologies, analyze or rationalize our faith in dialogues centered about these private topics which express our personal relationship to the God of Israel. We assume that members of other faith communities will feel similarly about their individual religious com commitment. Pause there for a moment. That, those two sentences basically summarize uh, what I was trying to say before, which is again, if you wanna learn about another religion, you could pick up a book at the store, you know, the, the Dummy's Guide to Catholicism or something like that. And as we've seen in other classes, there, that may be permitted and there may be value in that to learn about other places, but, the issue with interfaith dialogue is it's usually not, I'll sit here and you teach me something about your religion. Oh, that's so interesting. Let me ask you a few questions. And then back and forth. The kind of interfaith dialogue that they are imagining is a deep, uh, deep dive into the religious uh, uh, rationalizations. How do you understand the afterlife? How do you develop that? What's your source text for that? Really not for the sake of undermining or at least ideally that's not the intention, for the sake of learning from each other, but the kind of challenges that would come out might undermine and might challenge and force apologies and compromises on, oh, I see your point. Rav Soloveitchik said, we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna compromise on our value system. Obviously there needs to be a place for deep questioning, but we don't wanna do that in a setting where other religions that have historically wanted to get rid of our religion are gonna sit and say, can you explain this? We don't have to explain anything to you. We can love you and respect you. And, and maybe we want to learn about you. And we value that you have your own path. But don't make us explain ourselves. And this is an interesting thing that he says, we assume they don't want to either. Well, that's fascinating because the whole point of Vatican II is them saying that's exactly what we want to do. Um, but that's, again, the perspective that he's coming from is we don't want to challenge our assumptions. We don't want to be challenged. We have our religion. We'll work on ours, You, we do us, you do you, and as long as we can respect each other, we're good. So now he goes into specifically the things that should be forbidden based on that concern. Go ahead, Leonard. We would deem it improper to enter. Uh, kind of in the middle-ish. Oh, we would, de we would deem it improper to enter into di dialogues on such topics as Judaic monotheism and the Christian idea of Trinity. The messianic idea in Judaism and Christianity, Jewish attitude on Jesus, the concept of the covenant in Judaism and Christianity, the Eucharist mass and Jewish prayer service, the Holy Ghost and the prophetic inspiration, Isaiah and Christianity, the priest and the rabbi, sacrifice with the, with the Eucharist, the church and the synagogue, their sanctity and metaphysical nature, etc. There cannot be mutual and understanding concerning these topics for Jews and Christians will employ different categories and move within uh, incommensurate frames of reference and evaluation. Excellent. And, and there's, again, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. The idea that for Christians, Jesus is God and will be their Messiah. And for Jews, he's not God and he won't be the Messiah because he's dead. The, we can't come to a compromise on that. So how can there be a dialogue? Now, again, in practice, for rabbis that have done these interfaith dialogues, maybe they found some way to do that. So just because Rob Soloveitchik ruled this way, and we'll talk about how his ruling was adopted right in the next thing, um, doesn't mean that's the final answer. Uh, although the last answer we'll see today is fascinating for, for perhaps all the wrong reasons, but one of the best kept secrets of religions is that whenever you live door to another religion, whether you hate each other or not, you're gonna be influenced by each other. So all of these ideas of metaphysical, practical, the way a synagogue is physically built and set up, Jews, Christians, and Jews and Muslims have influenced each other throughout history. 
but he's talking here about formally sitting down and studying those texts together and saying, you know, you actually, you got it wrong. Because if any Christian said to me, the book of Isaiah said this, I'd be like, well, you're mistranslating it because you don't speak Hebrew. I wouldn't say it so flippantly because I'm a nice guy. Um, but those are the things that Rav Soloveitchik is concerned about. He says, look, we can't have conversations on things. We will never agree on the way the book of Isaiah is meant to be read. You read it fundamentally differently. And that's your choice. That is your religion. That is the way that, that you have developed and evolved. And more importantly, we are choosing to respect that. We didn't always, and many Jews still have bear that hatred and consider it idolatry, but we say that we respect you, but we're not gonna talk about this. But one thing, he, he does two things, major things different than Rav Moshe. He does not say that it is fundamentally forbidden against Jewish law. He basically says there's no point in it and it would be inappropriate. So if someone said, Rav Soloveitchik, we're doing it anyway, am I breaking? If they said, Rav Soloveitchik, should I do it? He would say, no. Rav Soloveitchik, we are doing it. I wish you didn't or something like that. Or I think it's inappropriate and I don't support it, but that's your choice. So that's one very important difference between him and Rav Moshe. And the second one is that Rav Soloveitchik is also saying there are certain topics on which there is no ability to have any kind of um, shared dialogue. But what he doesn't list here is social justice. Um, things about, I don't know if he would consider, you know, the, the nature of angels, but there are absolutely topics, practical things about politics. I mean, we shouldn't talk politics anyways, but there are things in which Jews and Christians absolutely can get together on and should get together on. Um, and that's a very important door that he opens up that again, Rav Moshe closed. So for modern Orthodox Jews, interfaith dialogue is not completely forbidden. It is not asur de right? it's not forbidden by the Torah, A. And B, um, while many, the, the mainstream today, as we'll, we'll see in just a second, is to not do it. For those uh, who want to have some kind of relationship with their colleagues in other religions, there are other things to do. And in fact, I have worked with uh, members of other religions and clergy on things having nothing to do with religion about uh, volunteering drives, et cetera, like that. And maybe when we're schmoozing and taking a break, you know, one of us might ask each other a question about, I'm so interested about Shabbat or something like that. That's not the kind of interfaith dialogue that Rav Moshe or that Rav Soloveitchik is concerned about. So we see here a much, a, a, a strong position, but much softer and leaving some room open. Now, when he wrote this letter to the RCA, then they got to basically write their not response to him, but they came out with a formal policy for their rabbis. And again, that's the point. Not talking to uh, two neighbors that live next to each other that want to sit around, drink a beer, and just you know shoot the breeze. He's, they're talking to their rabbis about formally joining these interfaith programs. So let's see, Arlette, actually, I would like to unmute you. And if you would please take for us the statement adopted by the RCA, uh, in, uh, there was actually a, a convention between the third and the fifth um, in February, 1964. So we, we just passed the, the anniversary of it a week or two ago. Um, so go ahead, please. We are pleased Thank to note. You. We are Sorry. pleased to note that in recent years, there has evolved in our country as well as throughout the world, a desire to seek better understanding and a mutual respect among the world's major faiths. The current threat of secularism and materialism and the modern aesthetic negation of religion and religious values makes even more imperative a harmonious relationship among the faiths. Pause there for a moment. This is actually in many ways a beautiful summation of that document by Vatican II. It's basically what we're saying, we need to do this now because all religions are suffering. We need, you know, we, we all, we used to hate each other. We all disagree with each other, but you know what? We need to band together because we're all trying to find meaning in this life and the afterlife. So we have to find some way to work together. But now what they're going to do is essentially parrot or summarize the language of Rob Soloveitchik. So go ahead, this relationship, however. This relationship, however, can only be of value if it will not be in conflict with the uniqueness of each religious community. Since each religious community is an individual entity which cannot be merged or equated with a community which is committed to a different faith. Each religious community is endowed with intrinsic dignity and metaphysical worth. 
its historical experience, its present dynamics, its hopes and aspirations for the future can only be interpreted in terms of full spiritual independence of and freedom from any relatedness to another faith community. Any suggestion that the historical and meta-historical worth of a faith community be viewed against the backdrop of another faith and the mere hint that a revision of basic historic attitudes is anticipated are incongruous with the fundamentals of religious liberty and freedom of conscience can only breed discord and suspicion. Such an approach is unacceptable to any self-respecting faith community that is proud of its past, vibrant and active in the present, and determined to live on in the future and to continue serving God in its own individual way. Only full appreciation on the part of all of the singular role, inherent worth, and basic prerogatives of each religious community will help promote the spirit of cooperation among the faiths. Pause there for a moment. So one of the things that they, they are doing very well in their diplomatic organization is they, again, and they're using many, much the language of Rob Soloveitchik, which is beautiful that he said it that way. And diplomatic. they're they're not knocking down the Vatican II thing. They're saying every religion has value and they're all beautiful. However, they need to stay separate when it gets to the real core things that they basically disagree with. Because if we didn't disagree with those things, we would all be one religion. The reason we're separate religions is because we have fundamental different philosophies and theology, theologies on certain issues. So here's an example of something that could happen in interfaith dialogue, and both groups would kind of leave grumbling, is there's something uh, in, in Hasidic Judaism, this idea of going to the, the graves of great rabbeim and davening there for them to intercede, to kind of you know daven on your behalf from heaven. Well, that idea, well, there are hints of it in classical Judaism was pretty much a new idea. Well, when did it come out? The exact same time that the Christians that were living next to the Jews developed something called the cult of saints, which is where they would go to the graves of their saints and pray to them uh, on behalf of heaven. Now, I cannot prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that those absolutely influenced each other, but there are lots of moments like that in history. And by the way, I don't think that diminishes any of these things. I think religions and people learning from each other is good, but you could look at that and say, oh, the reason that Jews do this practice is because they saw the Christians doing it and vice versa. And that would take away from the significance of it. And we would basically have to rewrite our whole story. And maybe we shouldn't do this practice because it's copying, et cetera, like that. And it could be damaging. Again, has it been in these religious dialogues? Um, and the flip side, which is, by understanding our shared history, knowing where we came from, the idea is that we would appreciate everything more and be stronger. That's the hope of it. Are we missing out on that? That's again, a fascinating question, which is, is being actively done by interfaith groups. Um, and you can look that up yourself, but at least in the 60s, this was the great concern. And then Arlette, if you wanna take just that last little piece, which again echoes the, there are appropriate times um, and, and things to talk about. Yeah, go ahead. It is, it is the prayerful hope of the Rabbinical Council of America that all interreligious discussion and activity will be confined to these dimensions and will be guided by the prophet Micha. Let all the people walk, each one in the name of his God, and we shall walk in the name of our Lord, our God, forever and ever. Excellent, thank you. So they again took the message of Rab Soloveitchik and kind of simplified it and made it, I don't know if they made it more diplomatic, but they made it popular. Also, if anyone's looking to record an audio book, um, Arlette seems like a good option. I'm sure she wouldn't mind being hired to record that. But this, to this day, 2022, is pretty much the standard in modern Orthodox uh, and more moderate middle of the road Orthodox circles, which is that having a relationship with clergy of another faith, there's nothing wrong with that. You can have a friend who's a priest or a preacher, et cetera, like that. Now, as we talked in a class earlier this year, Jews going into prayer spaces of other religions, that's problematic. And I don't do that. Um, and I am not a member of a formal interfaith council, but if someone from an interfaith organization reaches out and just says, can I Zoom with you? I just have questions. I just want to talk one-on-one. -on -one. 
that would be appropriate. Um, and certainly if it's about a social justice thing, and I have reached out to colleagues in the neighborhood about promoting events or fundraisers, et cetera. So if the local church is raising, is collecting um, clothes for a clothing drive for homeless people in Milwaukee, 100%, I will put that in that newsletter. I will put that on our Facebook page. I don't care that they are the Catholic Alliance. If they're doing something good that we have a shared value that doesn't undermine, no problem. Now, again, if I join an interfaith dialogue, would that be forbidden? Technically, no. If I got into a formal debate in front of the whole community about Isaiah and Christianity, would that destroy my religion and turn others to convert either way? Probably not likely, but this has become the mainstream opinion in almost every case uh, until today. Um, there is a slightly more, I don't want to say extreme, but basically, I'll say a slightly more extreme version of this, and this is represented very well in this short article from 2003. This person, Jonathan Rosenblum, is an incredibly well-educated um, person. I think he went to maybe Yale Law School, and he holds a lot of degrees. Uh, he did not grow up Orthodox. He became Orthodox, and what he actually does is he reaches out to mainstream media sources, newspapers, and he tries to explain the Haredi ultra-Orthodox world. So he's incredibly well-educated and his writing style is very accessible. And he takes, influenced by Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Moshe, a relatively more hardline view on why interfaith dialogue is pointless. But again, he does not say it's forbidden and he still opens the door for connections in other areas. Um, so let's see, Leon. Would you please read this short piece um, from this article from the Baltimore Jewish Times, which was what I used to read before I moved to Milwaukee for Jewish stuff. Go ahead, the, inter the issue of interfaith. The issue of interfaith dialogue is one of those hardy perennials. <clears throat> A recent conference sponsored by Boston's Col Boston College's Center for Christian Jew Jewish Learning discussed the continued applicability of the ban posed on such dialogue by Rabbi Joseph Bear Soloveitchik, the towering figure of modern orthodoxy. So again, what I was saying is back in the 60s, when this was all new, those were the opinions then. But now this is written 2003, even though it's from a Haredi perspective, we've actually seen decades of established interfaith dialogue should the door be opened up from a policy perspective. And what I did is I kind of just brought in his bullet points. He brought in more examples, but these are kind of his main points about why he does not think interfaith dialogue is valuable. Please. Interfaith dialogue is pointless because it can change nothing. Halakha or Jewish law is the province of those with a full command of the vast halakhic literature. There is no more place in the halakhic process for the opinions of those lacking such a grounding be they Jew or Gentile, than there is for polling synagogue members to determine halakhic practice. So by the way, the assumption there is that one of the outcomes of interfaith dialogue is that it might, the point is to kind of look and review Jewish law. I don't believe that's the point of almost any interfaith dialogue. I don't know if it ever has been or, or ever will be. So he's making certain assumptions about it. Oh, we'll have interfaith dialogue. Oh, and based on that, we should change our law. It's not the point of it. If it was, then his, his point here would be stronger. His next point is that it's dangerous. Go ahead, Leon. Interfaith dialogue is dangerous because such dialogue inevitably leads to the blurring of Judaism's own message. The nature of dialogue is that one elicits concessions and compromises from the other side only by making one's own concessions. Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs' comparison of interfaith dialogue to marriage counseling is highly germane, for in marital counseling, both sides will be urged to make concessions. This one is more, uh, it kind of echoes more Rob Soloveitchik's idea that when two uh, religions come in a dialogue, they're gonna have to, there's gonna have to be some give and take. We don't want to give. We don't want to, oh, be apologetic or admit that we're wrong about something or saying, oh, I guess that doesn't really make sense. We don't want to do that. So that's the, this concern here, again, is continuing that idea of Rob Soloveitchik. Please continue, finally. Finally, interfaith dialogue is unnecessary because its absence in no way prevents the development of pleasant, fruitful relations between people of different faiths. Religious people do in fact usually find large areas of commonality between them. Orthodox Jews, for instance, experience a much higher comfort level with evangelical Christians than do secular Jews, despite their issue of theological dialogue. The late Cardinal O'Connor would effusively hug Rabbi Moshe Scherer, 
the longtime head of Agudath Israel of America, whenever they met. Under Rabbi Scherer's leadership, Catholics and Orthodox Jews worked together productively on a host of issues concerning non-public schooling and public morality without ever engaging in theological discussions. Indeed, avoiding discussions of the chasm of belief between them fostered the ability to maintain a close alliance. Pointless, dangerous, and unnecessary. Those should be enough reasons for avoiding interfaith dialogue. Thank you. I saw multiple letters, contemporary letters, from rabbis in Israel from all different walks of life who essentially said that same thing. It's pointless, dangerous, it's unnecessary. Now, whether there's a, a, an inherent value to it, it's something that should be actively done, um, you know, and there's some value out of it, that's something that's up for debate. Um, the idea of whether or not it's dangerous, um, we, again, we could just look at practically what's happened. We could just, you know, I don't know if it's easy to poll every Jew who's ever rabbi who's been in, a, in an interfaith dialogue and say, did you convert to Christianity? I imagine the number would be quite small. Um, so the debate here is less about the danger and more about what's the value and what's the point of it. And I think there's, uh, there's points on both sides. Those who say that understanding others' faiths, who are our brothers and sisters, might help us understand our faith better better. I think there's some value in that. Do I personally choose to do that? No, but I don't want to take away from those who do that. But again, the mainstream Orthodox policy, and I'm emphasizing that word, because uh, apart from Rav Moshe and those who follow like him, nobody really says it's forbidden. It's just not done officially. Do Orthodox rabbis sit on and get involved in interfaith dialogues? Absolutely. Some with students, some with friends. And there are indeed Orthodox rabbis out there who are actively trying to make it official. Uh, and they're often you know, kind of going against the, the stream. But again, their thing is, again, it's not forbidden. They just have to prove that there's a point to it. And again, I'm not saying there isn't. But the assumption by all of these sources is that it is indeed pointless until you get to the last source that I'll take. So Rav Shlomo Riskin is truly a great rabbi. He was you know, from America, he was the rabbi of the Lincoln Square Synagogue, uh, which is a huge, beautiful synagogue. One of my friends is a, an assistant rabbi, or he interned there. Uh, and then he went to Israel and he just decided, to, not decided, but he made a community Efrat. So he is one of those rabbis who's just an incredible leader, incredible cult of personality, brilliant scholar. He is not the lone, but probably the biggest voice uh, in support of interfaith dialogue. He created or co-created an organization for formal interfaith dialogue between Christians and Jews. But here's the thing, it, for the most part, he's basically the only one in the Orthodox or modern Orthodox world that says formally we should do this. There are a few others, wonderful people I've met them who are doing it, but Rav Riskin is definitely the biggest one doing it by far. But here's what's interesting. His reasons for doing it are disturbing at best. So the background for, and he has, he has this 43 page article, it's in English, you could find it online, it's very interesting. But basically what he does is he says that God has created covenant with mankind three different times. The first one was with Noah, which is a sort of universal, but not really for all men, but it's this basic, you know, these fundamental Noahide laws for man. Then he went and made this particular covenant with the Jewish people. But then he made one more covenant, and he claims that that covenant, that promise, that relationship with people, what God expects of them is, in the, is basically the book of Deuteronomy, and that is a universal covenant, kind of the one we sing about in the prayer, Aleinu, at the end of prayers, that God should be over all the land, God should be recognized as king. That is the universal covenant for all mankind. Now, if according to Rob Riskin, that's the kind of universalist message of God's role in earth that Christians essentially believe that the figure of Jesus is doing. Now, our Riskin would say, I don't believe that, but fundamentally we're both working towards the same end, which is a universal belief and embracing of God and God's kingdom on earth. I, I don't agree with the way you did it, but we're all kind of trying to get towards the same thing. Jews have our own specific covenant, but there's another covenant that we all wanna to work towards. The question is, what's the best way to get there? And now in your paper, he's, you'll see how he uh, uh, uses it and why he thinks uh, interfaith dialogue, what the value of it is. So I started here. If I am correct in the interpreting of this third covenant to be a covenant for all the nations of the world, the implications of this debate are serious indeed. 
are Jews covenantally responsible to teach Gentiles, non-Jews, only the seven Noahide laws in the in the Talmud, based on the basically after the flood of Noah, uh, Noah, God comes down and he gives some basic laws to mankind about not murdering, um, certain things about animals. It's not the Torah, but it's some basic laws. The rabbis expand on that in the Talmud and come out with seven formal laws: belief in God, setting up a court system, not not going up to an animal and just wantonly murder it, like you have to properly slaughter animals, not kosher slaughter, but treat animals with more respect. Seven basic laws that all people, Jews and non-Jews should follow. Jews just have a lot more, hundreds more. Um, but he says, are we just supposed to be spreading the Noahide laws, those basic things that are kind of the cornerstones of civilization plus monotheism? So he continues, does the Bible and Talmud advocate converting the world to full Judaism? or merely to bring as many people as possible into the third covenant and the Noahide covenant with its seven fundamentals of morality? This question may be seen as a difference of opinion between the prophets Isaiah and Micah. Scholars disagree whether Maimonides believes that Gentiles and Jews will remain separate and distinct religious bodies in the eschaton, meaning the end of times. So what he's getting in here is maybe the ultimate goal is for all religions to come together under one religion. Well, what's that one religion? And he continues, we are, if, if, I was whispering, I said our religion, if you didn't hear me, we are however permitted and perhaps even encouraged to teach Gentiles the Torah and its commandments, an act that Maimonides saw as part of the commandment for Jews to love God. Finally, Maimonides contended that in the eschaton, again, the end of times, um, you know, like the world to come, uh, all will convert because it will be rationally and morally compelling for them to do so. So the, the Vatican too put out this document saying that every religion has something valuable to learn from each other that will enhance our own religions. And the rabbis debated if that was true, if it was dangerous. Um, Rav Moshe said, but I'm concerned they're trying to convert us. Rav Riskin says, we should all have interfaith dialogue so that maybe we can eventually convert all of the Christians. Well, so that's you know, quite, a, quite a journey there. So people that attack Rav Riskin and say, oh, you know, you're so liberal for interfaith dialogues, read this document and they might say, that's kind of crazy. That's actually more disturbing because um, you're more open about it. So Christianity sees itself as being grafted onto the Jewish covenant, God's covenant with Abraham. This is legitimate from a biblical and Jewish perspective, since Abraham, by his very name, is a patriarch of a multitude of nations, meaning that Christianity is not the successor of Judaism, but Abraham did give birth to the founders of all these other nations and religions. So yes, Christians, Muslims, all those religions do have a connection to Abraham. They are still our brothers and cousins, regardless of all the challenging history. Um, uh, by his very name as a patriarch of multitude of nations, Christianity worships Abraham's God of compassionate righteous, righteousness and justice. And traditional Christianity surely accepts the seven Noahide laws as given by God. The return of, by de facto, they don't formally say, oh, we're Noahide um, Christians. It's just the way Christianity, as he sees it, is set up. They have know the Noahide laws kind of boiled in there. So that's good. The return of the younger faith to its maternal roots was eased by leading theologians from most churches recognizing the permanent legitimacy of the Jewish covenant with God and the possibility of Jewish salvation on the merit of that covenant. The partnership between the daughter and mother religions is particularly important today. And this is again, really interesting because the, the Vatican document says all religions can be part of this, uh, this conversation. Rav Riskin is saying, really kind of maybe want to convert Christians, and we need to work with the Christians. Why? Because of extremist, um, Islamist extremism, against which all who are committed to a hopeful future must battle, including moderate Muslims. So he's not fundamentally attacking Islam. He's uh, attacking uh, uh, Islamic extremism, which I would also say is very negative as well. So he does want to bring in Muslims, but again, his reasons for this interfaith dialogue are very different uh, appears to be quite different from what the, the church was suggesting in the 60s, as far as we know. The Bible records a loving reconciliation between Isaac and Ishmael, uh, which is, represents Judaism and Islam, coming together and bringing their father to his eternal resting place. The God of Abraham is the God of love, compassion, and peace is the antithesis of Satan, who instructs violence against all those who do not accept its cruel prescription for world domination. Now that the Jewish people have returned to their homeland and to its empirical history, and now that Christians again recognize the legitimacy of the Jewish covenant, so which is essentially what happened in the 60s and has only gotten better, at least formally, with recent popes saying that, you know, other religions do not need to be Christian to get into heaven. Um, 
Jews and Christians must march together to bring a faith of morality and peace to a desperate but thirsting world. Now that statement, that we can work together on our shared values, that's what Rav Soloveitchik would support. That's certainly what the Vatican, uh, one of the things they would support. Rav Moshe, not so much. But that idea would be, if we're working together on the things that we do share, the Abrahamic ideals of righteousness, that's good. We dare not rest until we succeed and see justice roll like the water's compassionate righteousness as a mighty stream. This is our united mission, far more important than legitimate and the to be respected differences that divide us. And if the moderate religiously pluralistic Muslims join us, we will all not only survive as free people created the divine image in the divine image, we redeem ourselves and the entire world. So again, Rav Riskin is not explicitly breaking Jewish law, but it's he gives different reasons for interfaith dialogue. And some of them are troubling at best. And some of them are quite beautiful and have already been sort of proffered by earlier rabbis. But the, the summation of all this is that where things sit today in the Orthodox or modern Orthodox world, practically speaking, most Orthodox rabbis will not formally engage in interfaith dialogue, meaning formal theological conversations. Will some of them do it? Yes, a very small percentage. Will some of them do it informally with friends? Probably a lot more, a lot more than would ever admit to it. Um, and again, we're talking here about rabbis and formal leading figures. Is there a value in going with, out with your friend and, and drinking a beer or drinking a great knee high or whatever? I don't know if that's kosher. If it's kosher, you can drink it. And just kind of shooting the breeze, maybe. But again, the, the reasons for it are not, other than Rav Moshe, it's not that it's fundamentally forbidden. It's the question of what's the point of it and is it dangerous? But again, the next part of this conversation we're not going to have tonight is to look at the decades from the 60s and see what has come out of it. Has it led to mass conversion? And generally the answer to that is no. And the question is, is it something that really will enhance all religions? That I can't answer. I have talked with people of other faiths before and it didn't hurt me. I don't know that I got massive amounts out of it that I couldn't get from reading a book. But at the end of the day, is there a space for interfaith dialogue? Yes. Formally, practically, practically policy-wise, is it accepted in the Orthodox world? Officially, no. But as we know with most things, just because the rabbis say don't do it, doesn't mean people aren't going to do it. So we'll see over the next couple of decades if this interfaith dialogue grows, or people say, you know, we'll just stick to social justice things, but the theological debates we're not interested in other than a few people who will write some books on it. So it's actually still kind of, it's an evolving dialogue that's happening. And if it's something you've engaged in, you have not, other than Rav Moshe's opinion, you have not broken Jewish law, but do Orthodox Jews do it? Not for the most part, but again, it'll be very interesting to see if this develops and grows, especially with Rob Riskin's work, over the next couple of years, but how many people have read his 43 page document and see what he's really trying to get at? And if they read it, would they raise more eyebrows?